Good evening, everyone. My name is Andrew Fracknoy. I'm the astronomy instructor here at Foothill College in Los Altos Hills, California. And it's a great pleasure for me to welcome everyone here in the Smithwick Auditorium and everyone listening or watching us on the web to this, the 14th annual Silicon Valley Astronomy Lectures. Are, these lectures for the public are sponsored by NASA's Ames Research Center, the Foothill College Astronomy Program, the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, and the SETI Institute. Uh, and if you are listening or hearing us on the web, we hope you'll also enjoy the many other programs in our uh, YouTube uh, channel on the web. Uh, tonight's speaker is one of our favorite speakers. He's the only one who's been videotaped twice now. Um, and uh, Dr. David Morrison is both a senior scientist at NASA and he is the director of the Carl Sagan Center for the Study of Life in the Universe at the SETI Institute in Mountain View. He's an astrobiologist and a planetary scientist, and asteroids, which he's going to be talking about tonight, are one of his specialties in planetary science. In fact, he has been an international leader for two decades in defining the asteroid impact hazard, the threat that rocks from space pose to our planet, and indeed also a leader in planning approaches to planetary defense. So we want him tonight to talk both about the danger and what we do about it. Um, in recognition of this work, asteroid 2410 Morrison is named in his honor. Uh, he's also made many uh, contributions to the teaching of astronomy and space science, including the authorship of several college textbooks in astronomy, including the one we use right here at Foothill College. Um, he's a popular writer and a public lecturer, promoting not just astronomy, but the whole idea of a fact-based and reality-based perspective about such topics as creationism, climate change denial, and doomsdays from astronomical causes. And many of you probably heard his cogent analyses of the doomsday 2012 threat, uh, which we, by the way, survived just fine. Uh, recently, Dr. Morrison was awarded the NASA Exceptional Achievement Medal for using science to contract public fears about the end of the world. So it's a great pleasure for me now to introduce to you the man who saved the world many times over, Dr. David Morrison. Thank you, Andy, for that very kind introduction. Uh, sound check, can you hear me okay in the back? If you can't hear me, put up your hand. <laughs> Good. Well, it's really a pleasure to be here. And as Andy indicated, this has so far been an incredible week for science. Uh, the Kepler mission has found for the first time the proportion of planets, that is the proportion of stars that have Earth-sized planets in the habitable zone. This was one of the greatest objectives of the mission and I'm sure the numbers will be refined, but right now it comes out at about 20% of all the stars you see in the sky not only have planets, but they have Earth-like planets. I think this is one of the most spectacular results of science. It's the discovery of the decade. It's up there with the Higgs boson. And uh, it's all happened and been announced right here in Mountain View, and, uh, and I'm very proud to have been part of it and to have the chance to mention it to you also, although it's not my topic tonight. But uh, the idea of the risk that may be posed by asteroid impacts and ways we could defend against it is also a major topic because three big papers have come out in Science and Nature uh, just today and NASA held a big press conference on the subject uh, that's very close to my heart. Um, and I'm sure you will all read in tomorrow's papers because nearly every science journalist in the country, it seems to me, was on the press conference. You will read that scientists have decided the risk of impact is greater than we thought. And you are all supposed to shake in your boots because we have found more potential impactors than people had expected. Let me only say that uh, that is a matter of interpretation. There's a fairly wide range of estimates and in a fact, in fact, I don't particularly care about getting the proportions right on exactly what the risk is of impacts, just as I don't think the, the two decimal points 
analysis of the frequency of Earth-like planets is that important. The main thing is that it's there and it can happen and most people, when they think about it, feel that they would rather be warned of an incoming asteroid before it hit and they would rather have somebody trying to do something about it. So that's much of what I'm going to be talking about tonight. But let me focus particularly on the amazing event on February 15th of this year. In the Ural Mountains in Russia, on the city of Chelyabinsk, more than a million people, uh, when shortly after sunrise, the sky was lit up by a meteor bigger than any other meteor anybody alive had ever seen. It came in over the city, not exactly, fortunately, exploded at an altitude of about 20 kilometers. And uh, you see the explosion there through the trees. It was just shortly after sunrise, but at its brightest, this object was about as bright as the sun. I'll learn which button to push. Um, I am indebted to Peter Jeniskins, whom, uh, who was already mentioned, who is the lead author in one of the papers that was published today, and who had a wonderful experience of going to Russia right after the Chelyabinsk impact. Uh, as a scientist, but also as a tourist, and so he took some nice pictures to show you the sort of place we're going to. You see the name of Chelyabinsk up there. If you don't read Cyrillic, that may not be familiar, but that's the place. And not the city of Chelyabinsk, but just a, a view of the countryside. Heavy snow, it's in the Ural Mountains, and uh, this was very, very fortunate, because when this impactor, this asteroid, exploded in the atmosphere, it showered tens of thousands of small meteorites onto the ground, and they fell on snow. And all the local kids, particularly, but other people went out looking for these little holes in the snow and picking up the, uh, the meteorites. If it had fallen during the summer, most of them would probably have been lost just falling into the wet ground. So we have tens of thousands of pieces of this asteroid, and if you would like to own one, you can. You can find them on eBay all the time. There are also several legitimate astro uh, meteorite dealers that will, uh, will sell them to you. This is one of the best snapshots, not taken from a video, showing the object very near its peak brightness, when it was, as I say, uh, about as bright as the sun. Imagine this coming in. There's no sound, because it's traveling much faster than the speed of sound. The shock wave hasn't reached you. The sky suddenly lights up. And it's been interesting to see the videos of how the local people reacted. And the amazing thing to me is how, how few of them jumped up and down and yelled. They said, oh, yeah, there's something brighter than the sun, and <laughs> continued driving down the road. Uh, but anyway, here are some more pictures. These are taken from the, uh, the video cameras mounted on, in cars, the, the dash cams, which I expect we'll be finding in this country at some point, because they have them as protection against false accusations in the case of an accident or against a police officer who's trying to shake them down. And they keep a record of constantly of when they're driving. And incidentally, when a large meteorite, meteor comes over, they catch it. <laughs> this is a closer picture of the trail. Now, initially, you have a glowing trail because there's fiery material coming off of the meteorite. And then that dust that's left stays entrained in the atmosphere. And because there was a lot of heat deposited that went in, it actually sets up convection currents. You end up with two sets of clouds ro counter-rotating in the sky. Well, this is one of the most interesting and recent aspects. I told you that there were tens of thousands of individual small meteorites collected. And none of them was much bigger than a softball except there was this hole in the ice, uh, a big hole. Something broke through the ice. And I admit, I was very skeptical at first. It looked too cool. It looked too clean. I thought, well, some, somebody, as a prank, went out and sawed a circular hole in the ice. But uh, it did look like that was the direction that the meteor was coming. And so people, after the ice melted, went out there and searched for it. And just a few days ago, they hauled up a half-ton mass of rock, by far the biggest single piece of this object that fell. Still a very small fraction of it. 
Remember, this object that came in was 21 meters. Let's see. That would be about as big as a quarter of this auditorium. And uh, solid rock, and almost all of it disappeared in the process of coming in. It exploded. It was ablated by heating in the atmosphere. And just this one piece, this one big piece held together all the way to be perfectly targeted on that open hole in the lake. <laughs> Here's a map. This is also from Peter Jeniskins, showing the path of the meteor. <coughs> And you can see various sites that, that where it was observed and pieces were picked up. The white area shows the part of the path directly below where the main explosion took place. And you can see that that uh, point called Chebrakul on the left is far beyond where most of the meteorites were. That's where this big piece I just showed you was pulled out of the lake. And this is something that can happen in, in meteorites. that. Uh, it, it happened with the Sutter Mill meteorite that came in here uh, a little over a year ago, where it starts breaking up, the small pieces fall down, and the B1 biggest piece goes the furthest. So it's like this at the extension of the, uh, of the track. Well, this didn't kill anybody, but it definitely shook up the city of Chelyabinsk and also some of the small towns around there. You can imagine, as I said, that people saw this brilliant light, and most of them, strangely enough, ignored it. But a few, including kids in school, went out to the windows uh, to watch. And then a minute and a half later, the shock wave hit, and windows were broken. And you can see examples here. In most cases, it probably had a lot to do with the uh, quality of the construction, these being Soviet-era buildings. Some windows are knocked out, some are not. But the end was about 1,500 people were cut by flying glass, and some of them were hospitalized. No one killed, but it was a, a somewhat traumatic day for the people in Chelyabinsk. Well, I talked about meteorites. Black stones, they're the sort of thing that a lot of our meteorites are made of, and a lot of asteroids are made of, called an ordinary chondrite. And uh, most of them were little. You can see the fellow at the bottom with a hat holding about six or eight of these little ones in his hand. Uh, the one on the upper left is, is one of the biggest pieces recovered before this huge half-ton object that came out of the lake. Well, what was the impact of Chelyabinsk, if you'll forgive the pun? It was quite interesting for those of us who have been studying meteors, meteorites, and the hazard of impacts for a long time, because there really was reaction. There was worldwide media coverage, especially because they had these webcams going, and so there were lots of pictures of it. Now, one of the questions one could ask is, how would you react, or how would the Russians react if suddenly there were a huge explosion in the sky? And I had been concerned very much that the reaction of some people, and perhaps the Defense Department, would be to think this was an attack from the US or somebody else. In fact, what they did is upload their video cameras to, the, to YouTube almost instantly. And within a few hours, there were hundreds of these uh, video reports on YouTube. And I think that speaks very well for the, uh, the Russians. Uh, just as within a day or two, they were busy collecting and selling the meteorites for anyone that would, uh, would be there to find them. Well. U.S. has a system of surveillance cameras in orbit above the Earth that have always been very important for understanding the impact frequency of objects in the sort of size range of Chelyabinsk. Because there are explosions in the atmosphere that are detected every year, not as big as Chelyabinsk, but other objects that come in and explode at high altitude. There was a period in the 90s when Somebody was in charge of this process that thought the science was important and released the information because they could measure the, the size, the trajectory, the, where the explosion takes place. And then in the last five years, they absolutely stopped releasing the information. Well, in this case, they released the information within 24 hours, and they promised to continue to do it. In other words, they believe that although their primary purpose is to monitor clandestine nuclear explosions, for instance, 
that it is important that they make this contribution to science. <coughs> well, there was a planetary defense conference that was, uh, by coincidence, scheduled two months after Chelyabinsk. And we had had mostly geeky engineers and scientists at these conferences. Until this one, when two high-ranking people from FEMA came and spent the whole time there to begin to study what the civil defense or disaster implications would be of impacts like this. We also have for many years talked with scientists from Los, Los Alamos and Livermore, nuclear scientists, whose job is to, to design and, and build and test nuclear weapons. And as you might imagine, they have been a little shy about telling us all the technical details of the US nuclear arsenal. Well, at this meeting I'm talking about, this planetary defense conference, uh, fairly senior scientists from both Los Alamos and Livermore showed up and started telling us exactly what a neutron bomb is and what the effect of these explosions would be. And the Russians came and started doing the same thing. In fact, uh, a few weeks after Chelyabinsk, there was a formal proposal from the Russian military to the US Air Force to collaborate on finding and defending against asteroids. NASA, not coincidentally, doubled the amount it pays for asteroid surveys. And a few months later, released the Grand Challenge, which I'm going to come back to, which specifically put NASA on record as saying, this is important and we need to understand the bombardment our planet receives all the time from cosmic impacts. Well, of course, Chelyabinsk was by far the, the one we're all familiar with because it was seen by, by millions of people and watched by probably hundreds of millions of people on YouTube. But there was an even bigger impact that many of you may have heard of in Tunguska, <coughs> a wilderness area also in Siberia in 1908. And it was substantially larger. It was about 10 times the energy of the Chelyabinsk meteor. Chelyabinsk meteor exploded 20-some kilometers above the ground, and consequently, the shock wave was not that strong, even though it was enough to break windows. The Tunguska impact was closer to the ground. It exploded at about 8 kilometers altitude and destroyed an area the size of San Francisco. 10,000 trees were knocked over. 1,000 square kilometers of forest were destroyed. Uh, sometimes people show the, the impact pattern superimposed on Washington, D.C., and it just about fills the beltway. I'm not quite sure what the message should be, but, uh, <laughs> but there it is. And this is estimated at, at five megatons, whereas the Chalyabinsk impact was one-tenth that, at about 500 kilotons. And it appeared to have been a collision with a small stony asteroid, but bigger, twice as big as the Chelyabinsk. Therefore, it had more and 10 times more energy. It penetrated lower. And if you had been anywhere near ground zero, you would have been dead. However, there was no one near ground zero. Uh, this is in the, the taiga forest of Siberia. And not only was no one there to witness it, except from a distance where they saw this thing streak across the sky, but it was 17 years before the first official Russian scientific expedition got there to the site. Now, you might ask, what was wrong with the Russians that it took them 17 years to get there? And then you look at your timeline of history and note that what intervened was the, uh, the Bolshevik Revolution, the Russian Civil War, World War I. And basically, they went as soon as they could, as soon as they had pacified the situation enough that the scientists could get up there. They pacified it in terms of the Civil War. They have never figured out how to deal with the mosquitoes. <laughs> the mosquitoes are you know, that big and just swarm. And finally, I think the, uh, the conclusion of many people who have tried, gone there is it's better to go in the winter when it's very cold than to try to fight off the mosquitoes. Well, that's not the only impact that we've all heard of. We've all heard of the one that killed the dinosaurs. The impact at the end of the Cretaceous period 65 million years ago. And there, of course, it was not witnessed by anyone. The evidence was covered up and buried in sediments. The point of impact, which is uh, near Merida and the Yucatan Peninsula of, of uh, Mexico, 
is actually now covered not only partly by water, but by about 1,000 feet of limestone. So there's nothing that you can see walking around the surface. I'm not going to go through the whole story, but it is just too good not to tell a little bit about, because it was done by, by our colleagues across the bay at UC Berkeley, uh, particularly Louis Alvarez, the Nobel-winning physicist. And they went through a chain of argument, which to me is the classic piece of scientific deduction. What they found was in the layer of strata, exactly where this thing happened 65 million years ago, they're trying to interpret. They found a very thin layer of material enriched in iridium and other metals. Iridium is extremely rare on Earth because it has gone into the core of the planet when we differentiate with the iron. A lot of other so-called platinum group metals have too. How many of you own a piece of platinum jewelry? There's a reason. It's very rare. It's a lot more expensive than gold. And so when they found these, uh, these platinum group metals here, they went through an amazing chain of argument. They found it in two different places, thousands of miles apart. They said, let's assume that this is all over the world, this same layer. And then they said, how many atoms does that mean there are in this layer all over the world? And if you put them all into one lump, how big would it be? And if you assumed that the material, of course, wasn't all iridium, but that it had the proportion that we know from meteorites to be in the, the uh, asteroids, how big would the object be? And they came up with 10 to 15 kilometers, about 10 miles. It's just simple logic. The only measurement they had was the two data points of locations where there was iridium. And I think most people doing science would have been happy with that. They would have published a paper saying, we found this iridium. And it seems to be worldwide, and we suggest other people go look and find it too. But Luis Alvarez took the whole thing to its logical conclusion, as I just described to you. And so they published one paper in science that had the entire thing, from the discovery of the iridium all the way to concluding it was a 10-mile diameter asteroid that hit the Earth. And, well, I don't know how many of you are paleontologists, but they hated this. Here were people who'd been studying dinosaurs all their lives in great meticulous detail, and here was this damn smart aleki physicist from Berkeley who said, no, everything you've been doing is wrong, and, and uh, I can tell you what happened, and I can tell you what kind of object it was. There's still people who refuse to accept this, even for the end Cretaceous extinction. And it's led to a comment that is not unique to this field. In some cases, the only way you can eventually achieve scientific consensus is if the old people die. <laughs> anyway, we're now quite certain, except for a few old people, uh, <laughs> that this is what happened. And the uh, impact dug a deep crater and lofted incredible amounts of material up into the atmosphere. It fell back down as a meteor shower, as a meteor shower like none we've ever had. The, on the material falling back carried just as much energy as it had had when it was lifted up, and that essentially incinerated the surface of the Earth. If you had been living there, at least under clear skies, temperatures would have gone up to the point where forests burst into flame, Grasslands did. If you were a dinosaur, a big object, big guy, uh, you would have been killed almost instantly. And this provides what is, I think, an amusing answer, only slightly exaggerated. There has been a debate for many years. How long did it take the dinosaurs to go extinct? Millions of years or whatever. The answer is about one hour. That's how much time it took for this hot stuff to fall back and burn the surface of the Earth. On the other hand, if you were in the ocean, it would have no effect at all. If you lived in swamps, it would have no effect. It would be like a flash of heat that would go away. But the other effect was dark dust in the stratosphere, which lasted for a year or two and blocked sunlight almost completely from reaching the surface. And so even though you might have been in the ocean and been totally unconscious of this flash of heat, when the sun goes out for a year, you get a mass extinction there too. And the result was that 
more than, that something like 90% of all species went extinct. So let's ask the question very simply. <coughs> Why did dinosaurs go extinct? They were big and strong and beautiful, even pretty intelligent. You've all seen Jurassic Park, right? <laughs> Smart dinosaurs. They occupied environments all over the planet, including those that flew and those that lived in the sea. And usually the best way to survive some local catastrophe is to be widely distributed. And they would ruled the world for more than 100 million years, all over from the Arctic to the Antarctic. They were very successful. If you learned in school that they were dumb and uh, not successful and succumbed to disease and so forth, you can put that all aside. They were killed by a catastrophe. They had all those good things, but they didn't have telescopes, <laughs> so they couldn't see the asteroid coming, and they didn't have a space program. Maybe on, the only fundamental difference between us and the dinosaurs is we have both telescopes and a space program. And so if and when the next one of those happens, and it's not frequent, we at least have the possibility of defending ourselves, something the dinosaurs would have had no concept of, even if they were as smart as the velociraptors in Jurassic Park. Now, what do I mean by near-Earth asteroids? These are the ones I'm talking about. They're not out in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, but they do come close to the Earth there. Their orbits intersect the orbit of the Earth. They are so-called Earth-crossing asteroids. <coughs> and here are three pictures from spacecraft. They're not beautiful. They're often described as looking like potatoes. They have impacts on them because they've been bombarded by smaller asteroids. But if we were going to be hit by an object several kilometers across, it would probably look like one of those. The object that killed the dinosaurs probably looked sort of like that. This is the one we probably know most about, um, thanks to our Japanese colleagues who sent a wonderful space mission that you may not have heard about to an asteroid called Itokawa, which is about 500 meters long, which means it's fairly good size. And it looks like it suffered a lot. There are smooth areas, there are few craters, there are mostly boulders on the surface. In fact, it pretty much looks like it was two asteroids that came together. <clears throat> but they not only photographed it, measured its mass and so on, they actually landed briefly on the surface, picked up material and brought it back to Earth. A real tour de force as far as space missions are concerned. Now they are in the process of building a second one. I think this is the one that they're calling Hayabusa B, which will go to another asteroid and not only go down and pick up surface material, but sort of dust it, get the dust off first by sending a small probe that explodes and cleans off the surface and then following it with their, their nose, anteater nose that goes down and collects some. And they have plans for other missions beyond that. So if you think of the space programs that would be relevant to protecting the Earth, <coughs> I think the, the Japanese are probably ahead of us all. Although, you may not know that just a few months ago, a Chinese spacecraft flew very close to a big near-Earth asteroid called Tocatus. <coughs> Tocatus. And it flew a little too close. Tocatus is big. It's, it's about three kilometers long and they wanted to fly maybe five kilometers from it. They actually flew 700 meters from the surface, which is a little close for comfort, but it was still a tremendous success, and there are photographs now on the web that you can see of a Chinese mission that's gone to near-Earth asteroids. We tend to forget that. How many of you have seen the movie Gravity? Did you know before you saw that movie that the Chinese have an operating space station in orbit? They do. They're doing very well. But we don't want to get in politics here, do we? Well, astronomers began to think about this problem primarily because the, 
excuse me, <coughs> because the uh, KT extinction, the end Cretaceous mass extinction, you know, that was the big story of the 80s. And it really changed our, our thinking about how evolution takes place. Because it showed us that in addition to the gradual evolution that everybody learns about in school, where, where your different animals in the same species or different species are competing, some can run faster, some are smarter, some are more disease resistant, and you know, you'll gradually get better and better at what you do. And that had been the case with the dinosaurs for all those years. Well, suddenly, an impact came and changed it all. It was a complete, it was a catastrophe for which evolution had not prepared them. And it makes us think that there is, are these two, <coughs> these two paces in evolution. There's the gradual, which happens all the time, in which plants, animals, whatever, get better and better and better at doing what they do. And then a cosmic catastrophe comes along, following completely different rules. So what if the dinosaurs were big and strong? So what if they could take leaves off the top of plants? So what if they could run fast? It did not protect them from the impact. In fact, the best way to be protected from the KT impact was to be small. And the land animals that survived were no bigger than a cat because they could hide. They could go underground. They could go into holes. They could, in some cases, probably survive for many months by hibernating. And they're the ones that made it through this bottleneck, this evolutionary bottleneck. Anyway, that had inspired a lot of interest. And in 1991, in a rare moment of brilliance, the Congress asked NASA to, uh, to deal with this. And I love this statement because, I, I mean, it really is good. It's the House Committee on Science and Technology. They said that it's imperative that the detection rate of Earth orbit crossing asteroids be increased and the means to alter or destroy them, the, the defense part, should be looked at. And then this is the key thing. The chances of Earth being struck by a large asteroid are extremely small. But because the consequences of such a collision are extremely large, the committee believes it's only prudent to assess the nature of the threat and prepare to deal with it. When I get back to the NASA Grand Challenge, you'll see it's almost identical wording. We need to understand the threat, and we need to begin at least to be prepared to how we'd respond to it. Well, it took 20-some years before the government outside of NASA took notice of it. And this was a considerable accomplishment in 2010 when the White House and the White House Science Advisor officially stated what the U.S. government policy was on this hazard. They said what's absolutely true, you have to start with, with finding them. If you can't find them, none of the else is relevant. That NASA, because that's what it's been doing for 20 years, should retain the responsibility for these surveys. That NASA should work with FEMA in the case of a small impact without warning, because then that's just like another natural disaster. And that if we really have to shoot down an asteroid, obviously that's not a good job for NASA and we should work with the Department of Defense and the Department of Homeland Security. And this then, for the first time, answered the question astronomers have said sort of in humor. If I go out with my telescope and find an asteroid headed for the Earth, who do I call? <laughs> the answer is, you call Lindley Johnson at NASA headquarters, and he talks to John Grunsfield at NASA headquarters, and he talks to Charlie Bolden, the NASA administrator, and Charlie Bolden calls up that man, John Holdren, and John Holdren runs into the, from the West Wing into the office and tells the president. And that's all supposed to happen very quickly if we ever actually have indication of an incoming object. Well, if we want to protect ourselves, and I think most of us feel that might not be a bad idea, the first task, obviously, is to find them. We can't hide from them, we can't do civil defense, we can't defend ourselves in any way if we don't find them and know they're coming. Second task is to find them and calculate their orbits. So from the data that we take from ground-based or space-based telescopes, 
we can predict where they will be in the future. Third task is to identify which of those are potentially hazardous and again calculate their orbits long before they hit. We're not talking about a last minute defense. We're not talking about sending Bruce Willis or, or the <laughs> rockets from movie media or any of those things up. We're talking about having long time warning so that we can go about this in a logical way and not blow up an asteroid, but just change its orbit slightly. The finding part is something that NASA has been doing for 20 years. We call it the Space Guard Survey. If any of you are real science fiction fans, you may remember that Arthur Clarke, in one of his novels, has its start with a meteor impacting over Venice and Ravenna and destroying them. And the story in this is that following that, the leaders of the world came together and decided we must never again let an object come up on us without warning, and they called their response Space Guard. And so we wrote to Arthur Clarke and made sure it was okay with him and used that name for the, this program. It initially was focused on finding objects larger than one kilometer in diameter for two reasons. First, it's a hell of a lot easier to find a large asteroid than a small one, as you can imagine. Secondly, when you go through the risk analysis, we're actually more at risk from impact of a kilometer or larger asteroid than we are from a smaller one, even though the smaller ones are more numerous. So the easiest thing to do, which was find relatively large near-Earth asteroids, was also the most cost-effective way to deal with this hazard. Well, if you've heard me talk before, I've been showing the same graph for nearly 20 years. It is what we at NASA sometimes call a notional graph, which means it tells you something, but it's not based on real precise data. And what it shows is the frequency of impact on the Earth, on the whole planet, up here, against the size of the incoming asteroid, but size now is measured in terms of energy, because impact energy that really matters. And faster moving one, of course, will have more energy. So the unit there is megatons, the same unit we use for nuclear weapons. And you can find this curve, which is approximate, defines pretty well what those frequencies are. And you start with this end Cretaceous object thing that uh, is about once every 100 million years. Tunguska that I told you about is uh, once every couple of centuries, probably. And when we did this, Clark Chapman and I put this graph together in 1990. And with very little data, but it turns out more or less correct. We came to the conclusion, we asked, well, how often would something of the energy of the Hiroshima nuclear bomb hit? 15 kilotons. And on this curve, it came out once a year. And we looked at each other and we said, oh shit, uh, we must have done something wrong. How can we not be aware if something the size of the Hiroshima bomb is going off on Earth every year? And then we thought about it some more and said, ah, those objects are so small that they burn up high in the atmosphere. They don't come down low like Tunguska or Chelyabinsk. And if they burn up high enough in the atmosphere, there's no shock wave that reaches the ground. We don't know about them. So it could be happening every year, and we would all be innocent of it. And then we did the next piece of logic. We said, who would know if such things were happening? And it comes back to the story I was telling you before, that we have these surveillance satellites. They're constantly looking down at the Earth and would see a flash of light in the atmosphere. This was just at the end of the Cold War, and we were fortunate to have a friend who was the commandant of the, uh, the Air Force Space Command in Falcon Air Force Base in, in Colorado, whom some of you know of, named Pete Warden. And he'd been interested in asteroids for a long time, so he invited us to come to, uh, to visit this highly secure place and ushered us through all the, uh, the guards and barbed wire and everything into the inner sanctum where they analyzed these data. 
And it was a very interesting discussion. It was a longer one, but I can paraphrase it as we said to them, to the operators, do you ever see explosions in the high atmosphere? And they said, yes. And we said, do you know what they are? And they said, yes, meteors. We've been watching them for 25 years. <laughs> so we found out, uh, and uh, as I say, it was the end of the Cold War, and it became readily available, although, as I told you, in the last 10 years, that, that dried up until just recently when they've started releasing that information again. The Space Guard Survey, for those of you who are interested in astronomy, is not big telescopes at all. These are one meter sized telescopes. And they're not expensive. This didn't cost much money. What they do have is state of the art detectors, CCD wide angle, and really good computers. It could not have been done 20 years ago. The computing power just didn't exist. But what you do is you take a, a, a photo, a CCD image of the sky, go back 20 minutes later and do the same thing, 20 minutes later, the same thing, and the computer calculates anything that changes between those three pictures. And if it changes, and it's a little moving dot, very faint, otherwise completely lost in the background of tens of thousands or millions of stars, that's your asteroid. And then you do that the next night, the next night, and pretty soon you begin to get an orbit. If you want an accurate orbit, you depend very much on amateur astronomers with good telescopes. They're also one meter class telescopes that go and follow up and get more positions. And in case you're wondering about this being some weird secret government program, it's absolutely transparent and fast. The, the astronomers are out every clear night finding these objects. The ob their, their data are sent back to Cambridge, Massachusetts. A preliminary orbit is computed on that one night's data and that is published on the web by 3 p.m. that day. And then the amateurs or others can look on that website at 3 p.m. and figure out what they should observe that night to follow up. It's a really cool system. Well, I, what am I doing here? But we'd already done that. Yeah. A lot of what we did early on was to try to address the question that Congress had asked. What is the hazard? How often is there an impact to worry about? But you end up with statistical answers that really aren't the best way to look at it. Because what we know is that a moderately large impact, nothing like a mass extinction event, could nevertheless destroy a significant part of civilization. It could knock out a country. Or what even one, one you know, knock out New York. Uh, it could have a profound effect on the economy, on what we're doing. And so it's not likely, but if you're really serious about this, you have to ask, what's the worst case scenario and what should we do? Well, this is a summary of the Space Guard uh, survey progress. Um, the ones that we're most interested in, the ones a kilometer or larger, are the red line, and the blue line is all discoveries. Do you think you can tell by looking at that graph where the first NASA money went into this. <laughs> right at the inflection point in 1998. And with NASA support, more telescopes came online and the rate of discovery went up until it's now just a little over 10,000. So we've gone from a case in the early 80s where there were a dozen or two dozen near-Earth asteroids discovered up here to 10,000. That really sounds good, right? And we can tell you that none of those 10,000 is on a collision course with Earth, because we've calculated their orbits. Let's ask instead, what fraction of the population up there has been found? It's very different. We found 94% of those larger than a kilometer, 60% of those in the half kilometer range, 15% in the 200 meter, less than 1% in the Tunguska range, much, much less than 1% in the Chelyabinsk range. There are a million small near-Earth asteroids that are big enough to cause damage on Earth if they hit us. And we've only skimmed off the cream. I'm glad we did, because the big ones are the most dangerous. But we, if we are really serious about it, we have to ask, can we find these others? Well, there are other things we can do. Uh, the radar at Arecibo in Puerto Rico, that I'm sure most of you are familiar with, 
is used about 10% of the time to bounce, bounce radar waves off near-Earth asteroids, which gives you a wonderful way to make radar images like that, or like that one with a satellite going around it, uh, without having to send a spacecraft. There's also been interest recently in what I told you at first we wouldn't try to do. What about trying to look for last night impacts? If it were Chelyabinsk, you'd never have found it because it came from the direction of the sun. No way that you could see that with any instrument. But if we're coming from the opposite direction, <coughs> there's a little system called Atlas, which is being proposed and actually built, should be online in a couple years, which has several stations around designed just not to look for the survey, not the catalogs, but just look for an object that was in a few days of hitting. What could you do? Well, you can't stop it. But you could evacuate. Or even if it were only an hour or two's warning, you could tell people to not stand next to the windows like they did in Chile Evans. Uh, there's a major activity in the UN right now. Uh, I'm not part of it. And in some ways, I'm glad because I find the UN incredibly bureaucratic and cumbersome. But the result for the first time is that there's an international effort that's recognizing the impact hazard. And then we come, in the end, to the question, well, what if we do find an object coming? Uh, I will tell you, first of all, that, that it usually takes quite a few observations over weeks or maybe even years to be confident that the object is going to hit the Earth. And one of the questions that we all ask, and maybe I should ask for a show of hands, at what level of confidence of a prediction of an impact, say, with California, would you think we should do something about it? Would you worry if it were a 50% chance of hitting? Yeah. What about a 10% chance? What about a 1% chance? You know, it, it's, it's interesting. People, you ask that question in different ways, you get different answers. But in principle, at least, if we did find something from the Space Guard survey or its extensions, we could change the orbit of the asteroid, not blow it up, but give it a nudge several years in advance so that when you predicted after several times around the sun that the asteroid and Earth were in the same position, you have to move either the Earth or the asteroid, right? Which is easy. <laughs> move the asteroid. Run, just run into it with a spacecraft and change its speed a tiny bit years in advance, and when the time comes, it'll go right past the Earth and, and do nothing. There's no way we could deal with any other natural hazard in this definitive way. Here we sit next to the San Andreas Fault. We know the strain is building up. We know it will give way. I can't imagine anybody ever stopping it. I can't imagine everybody, anybody ever stopping a hurricane or a storm, super storm, storm Sandy or a volcanic eruption or tornadoes. But this is something that we have the technology to protect the Earth. Now, we haven't developed it. We've never done an experiment to nudge an asteroid. And I really think we should. An innocent asteroid. <laughs> you know, one that's not going to cause any problem, but measure how you change its orbit. Nuclear people even say that. They say, well, you know, let's nuke an innocent asteroid. Hmm, maybe. There are lots of them. There are a million, so I don't think we'd miss them. I'm also under the impression we have more than enough nuclear bombs that it wouldn't hurt to, to use up some. The defense strategy depends on how much warning you have and how big the impact is. If it's greater than 100 meters in size, that's bigger than Tunguska, you'd really be willing to spend billions of dollars to deflect it, because that could do terrible damage. If it's much smaller than that, it's like I asked you the question about probability. You can go through the same thing. Well, what size asteroid, if it were predicted, would you evacuate? And then what side, if you were a scientist, would you go to watch? <laughs> well, Chelyabinsk, you would go to watch. Uh, you know, but a little bit bigger, you'd probably hightail it the other way. And when you really come down to it, with this million asteroids that are out there, it's going to be a very long time, if ever, before we actually find them all. And uh, so the most likely event the most likely event in your lifetime and mine will be something like Chelyabinsk that comes out without being detected. Now, it used to be that I had nightmares, almost literally, and all my colleagues did, 
when we began to understand this about how would the military of the US and the USSR react if suddenly there were a megaton explosion in the atmosphere. And we seriously talked about if it came without warning and if it came over a sensitive area, could this trigger a nuclear war? That would be the worst outcome of an object like Chelyabinsk or Tunguska. Well, nature gave us a great example because the area about Chelyabinsk is one of the most sensitive military areas in Russia. It's where their equivalent of, uh, of Livermore Lab is. It's where they build their nuclear submarine uh, rockets. It's where they keep nuclear storage of nuclear waste. I was there once, one of the biggest nuclear accidents that ever took place back around 1960 was a lake that they filled with nuclear waste and they put too much in and the whole water started boiling and the whole thing exploded. Uh, it's okay now, but I was a little uncertain when our bus pulled up next to it. We didn't know where we were going. Asked us to go, and I'll say, look, look, there's the place where the big thing was. But it's a very sensitive area. And as far as I know, there was no one in the Russian military that suggested it was an American attack. They didn't put their forces on alert or anything. And boy, I can't imagine areas much more sensitive than that. So I think we can be confident that the US and Russian military at least understand this problem and it's not going to be a natural event that triggers a nuclear war. That may not be true everywhere. If it had come over Srinagar in Kashmir at a time when there was high tension between the Pakistanis and the Indians, I don't know. Uh, but I feel a lot safer and a lot less worried about impacts than I did a year ago. Now there's another possibility and that is to find asteroid targets for human exploration. The point being that if we want to eventually get to Mars or explore anywhere beyond the inner solar system, we need to get experience going beyond low Earth orbit or even beyond the moon. And the next nearest thing to go to is a near Earth asteroid. And so the president in May 2010 actually said to NASA that, that we were, by 2025, we should send a human expedition to a near-Earth asteroid. Now, there are a little, few problems with that. We have hardly any that we have found that are small enough and in the right place to go to. You would think this would spur a lot more effort on surveys, and it hasn't. But this is what the administrator Bolden said. I heard him. He says, the main priorities of the White House for NASA are education, international cooperation, and planetary defense. And we always said, really? Not? Science, not human spaceflight. Anyway, uh, the problem is to find targets. And it's very hard unless we go to a much more sensitive survey system. So NASA, this spring, came out with words that I love, a grand challenge, that we should find all the near-Earth asteroids that are a major threat to human populations and determine how to deal with them. Now, if that were backed up with money, all my dreams would come true. <laughs> we would actually have a true asteroid defense system. Well, so far, there hasn't been money, and you can decide whether to blame NASA or the White House or the Congress. But there is an alternative, and many of you may know that Ed Liu, an astronaut who lives right here, has formed a serious plan with the B612 Foundation to get public money, that is to get private money from people to carry out this really good high-tech survey called the Sentinel Mission. If you have not heard of this, I wonder why it's called the B612 Foundation. I should ask how many of you when you were kids or when your kids were kids uh, read Antoine de Saint-Exupéry's The Little Prince. The, the, the asteroid in which the Little Prince lived was called B612. Um, but the Sentinel mission, they have a, a firm fixed price contract. They have agreement with NASA to do the tracking. They have agreement with SpaceX to launch it. And they want to launch the Sentinel mission in 2017 or 2018 if they can only find another $475 million. Please think about digging deep. 
It's not that big a telescope, but it's sensitive in the infrared, which makes it much easier to find asteroids, which are dark and glow in the dark. Uh, 2018 launch, continuously scanned the sky in the infrared. It's in an inner orbit. It's not orbiting the Earth. It's orbiting the sun, always looking out. So it catches asteroids that they're, when they're most obvious, when you're looking with the sun at your back and you're looking at them. And they believed that they could find asteroids at a rate of 50,000 per year. Now, I told you, in the whole history till now, we found 10,000. And we're currently finding about 1,000 a year. This is a nearly two orders of magnitude increase. And frankly, that's the only way we're going to solve the problem, so it's defense or resources or whatever. We've got to carry out that survey. And right now, given the dysfunction and problems in Washington, I think this private goal is the most likely. Let me conclude by quoting my thesis advisor, Carl Sagan, who was interested in this problem long before most of us knew about it, and put it in a cosmic context. Because he said, if, if our planet is subject to impacts and mass extinctions, this might be true of any other planet in some other system. So he said, since hazards from asteroids and comets must apply to inhabited planets, all over the galaxy if there are such. Intelligent beings everywhere will have to unify their home worlds politically, leave their planets, and move small nearby worlds around. The eventual choice of any intelligent beings on a planet in a solar system like ours is spaceflight or extinction. And that brings me back to my original point about the asteroids. They did not have spaceflight. They did not have telescopes and they went extinct, and we don't want to do the same thing. Thank you. Uh, um. Um, uh, if an asteroid the size of one kilometer actually hits the Earth, um, what are going to be the reactions? Like, if it actually hits and a huge asteroid? What size? One kilometer. One kilometer. Well, it wouldn't produce a mass extinction. So you wouldn't have to worry about going the way of the dinosaurs. But it would dig a crater and put dust into the atmosphere and huh. basically kill the crops. Yeah, and I know, so, but what would be the econo economic reaction? I will leave it to your imagination of what would happen if we couldn't harvest any crops for a year. I don't think it would be much fun. So that's what we worry about with one kilometer asteroids. Unless you happen to be at ground zero where it hit, in which case you wouldn't have to worry about that at all. <laughs> Um, hi. So, uh, to keep it brief, I was just wondering if you could elaborate on the nature of explosions caused by asteroids and explosions caused by nuclear bombs, because we, we hear them compared a lot, but I'd like you to elaborate on the differences, if there are any, or how they might be similar. Well, the, of course, if they have the same megatonnage, it's going to be rather similar. But asteroids are a lot bigger. We, I, I showed you a graph with asteroids that at the thousands of megatons, the largest nuclear bombs we have in our arsenal now are about two megatons. So asteroids are a lot worse. The only good thing is that you can predict them coming, and they don't involve radioactivity. But I don't think we'd care that much about radioactivity if we were hit by a thousand megaton explosion. Uh, given all the work that's gone on into prediction, um, how much notice did we have about the, the timing and the location of the, the Chelyabinsk meteorite, meteorite when it came? And I also have another question which I'll ask. Well, let's take one at yeah, a time. The yeah. first one is very easy. It was coming from the direction of the sun. We had no telescope that could have seen it. Even if we'd had much bigger telescopes, we wouldn't have seen it. And the first thing anybody saw was the flash of light going across the sky. Second question. 
the strategic defense initiative uh, back to the 1980s from Ronald Reagan, President Reagan, mm -hmm. it was must, much derided at the time, but is there anything in all of the research uh, done that could now be useful in, in you know, tracking and, and dealing with uh, uh, large near-Earth objects that may be headed this way? That's a good question about the Strategic Defense Initiative. Uh, it, it was designed entirely to defend against missiles launched by somebody else. Ballistic missiles that are only in transit for 15 or 20 minutes and then come in. And so it had to have things based in orbit to try to shoot, to detect and shoot those down in extraordinarily short periods of time. That's really not at all like an incoming asteroid. We would hope to have warning of, of years. We might have warning of days for little ones. But frankly, if I had a little one coming in, I would rather just evacuate the same way we did with Katrina in New Orleans. So there's technology there. They did a lot of miniaturization that's helped the space program. But the specifics of what they're trying to protect against, they were in SDS, in Star Wars, is very different from asteroids. Uh, I know earlier you mentioned uh, SpaceX, but I was curious if you had if you had heard of and if so had anything to say about uh, I think it was called Planetary Resources, which is another private space company that was I had heard was planning to launch a prototype of their own asteroid search satellite within the next year, but I'm not sure how reliable that is. It's a good question. I talked about the science of um, near Earth asteroids. I talked a lot about defense. I did not talk about them as resources. And certainly, if we can imagine a real space infrastructure, uh, they would be the primary source of raw materials, including carbon, water, hydrogen. Uh, you could bring small near-Earth asteroids in and, and use that. But that is so far from what we're doing now. I think these are visionary companies, the space resources companies. But boy, I don't know what their business plan is. I don't see how they're going to get a return on, on investment very quickly. I was but hey, more power to them. Oh no, I mean that's interesting. But I was more interested in what you, um, they were talking about launching um, survey satellites to look for near Earth asteroids very, very soon. I wasn't sure if you'd heard anything about that. Is what I was more curious about. Good for them. I think the ones I have heard are talking about very small things like cubesats that will look for objects close to Earth, and they wouldn't give the long lead time. Okay. The beauty of the, the space guard approach is if you have years of warning, it opens up a huge envelope of things you could do, ways you could visit it. And again, I'm, I don't know that much about them. I, I worry about their business plan. <laughs> Thank you. Interesting talk. Uh, if I may ask a, a question about detection and response, uh, two questions, I guess. Uh, in terms of detection, for uh, object coming sunward, uh, would radar be an effective means of detection, uh, a large phase array or something like that? Yeah. It's a good question about radar, because naturally people think of the fact that we had a, a radar system to protect against enemy bombers or, or whatever coming in. Turns out radar is very ineffective here for two reasons. One is that you have a r to the fourth instead of r squared variation because the power has to go out with the one over r squared, come off the surface and come back. So radar is inherently short range. The other thing is that the systems we use now, uh, you basically have to know where to start looking and the speed in order to get a radar beam on them. And maybe that could be overcome, but the problem that it's only uh, a very close in detection system is just basic physics. And you mentioned uh, for a small object uh, basically doing nothing and predicting its impact, perhaps evacuating that area. How practical would it be to uh, predict the, the impact point for something going through the atmosphere and coming in? Well, probably anyone here could answer that as well as I do. That's why FEMA's involved. If you gave a warning to a city that there was a 20% chance of an impact in a week, what would people do? 
They have no previous experience. Nowadays, when it's a storm, you know, people say, oh, I rode out the hurricane 10 years ago. I'll stay for this one. People here may say, oh, this is nonsense. You know, it's never happened. Now that Chelyabinsk has come, maybe it would be taken more seriously. But it becomes a, a social issue of how people would respond to a warning. I, I think this is more of an orbital mechanics question. F you mean how certain we would be where it was going to hit? Well, that all depends on the quality of the observations and how long we've been observing. For these distant objects, the space card survey looks at, follow up by amateurs and all that, you get hundreds of observations and you can calculate very well where it's going to be for decades in the future. Uh, last minute type thing, I don't know. I don't know how quickly we could turn it around. I don't know how the local governments would react if we said there was a, it might happen. And you probably couldn't say just where it would happen. Instead of saying the city of Chelyabinsk, what if you said the whole Chelyabinsk blast, the whole big state? Uh, people wouldn't know where to go. I don't know. Okay, so, hi. Um, so like all those research teams that you've sent to collect samples from asteroids like Shibbing, could you like actually, have you like tried isolating the compounds from the materials and try figuring out what elements are present in those asteroids? Because like when you think about it, like think about it, um, you know the Big Bang Theory, we have like this ex explosion and then matter and energy being sp spread ap apart from one another. And then we have the creation of the first elements, hydrogen and helium, and, and then more elements form after that. And then we have gravity forming stars plus stars and galaxies so each so i thought that each like in space there might be different parts uh, regions having different elements well the asteroids are all of them leftovers from the early formation of the solar system they tend to be four to four and a half billion years old and we can tell something about what they're made of with telescopes but we have just one wonderful advantage there are 50,000 samples, meteorites, that are in our collections here on Earth. And we have more samples of meteorites than we do of the moon. And so we have a real ground truth, and that's why there's a whole profession called meteoritics, of people that analyze in detail what these meteorites are made of, and then use that to understand the asteroids. Yeah. How are we doing, a couple more? I think so. I have a semi-political question. If you have a conventional rocket impacting one of these objects, you probably will be able to deliver 10 to the 13th joules. Proposed large ion drive systems might get up to 10 to the 14th joules. Off-the-shelf nuclear weapons are able to deliver 10 to the 16th joules. This is several orders of magnitude above any competing technology. And yet, there is an enormous dislike of nuclear explosives. There seems to be a nuclear allergy. And there's a lot of people who, when you discuss asteroid deflection methods, are willing to consider anything except nuclear explosives. Do you think this is fundamentally a political problem, or is it a psychological problem? And what do you think we can do about it? Well, I agree with you. And I have talked to audiences and actually posed, this, and students in particular, posed the question, if there were an asteroid headed for this city and the only way to stop it would be with a nuclear explosion, would that be okay? And there are people who have up that stand and said, no, I'd rather die than have a <laughs> nuclear explosion. I don't understand that feeling. Now, there's a practical question of how you divert an asteroid. And it's momentum, not energy. And if you simply run into it with a mass of a ton or 10 tons, you transfer enough momentum to change its orbit. We actually understand that physics a lot better than we understand what would happen with a nuclear explosion. So we're kind of dealing from things we understand, but I absolutely agree with you that this, this fear of nuclear is a very, I guess, understandable, but it's a, a pervasive psychological thing. This is a question about uh, kind of collision dynamics. If, if 
Tunguska or Chelyabinsk had come in a few hours earlier or a few hours later and dropped in one of the, the Atlantic or the Pacific, uh, what would the effect be? Uh, the misery would be spread or, or mitigated? Well, first of all, I don't mean to be flip, but if it had come even a few minutes earlier or later, it would have missed the Earth because the Earth moves its whole diameter in about five minutes. So, you know, it's a little bit of a false question. If something like that exploded over the ocean, there would be no waves, nothing. So you would not have to worry about that. If a bigger one, if something, say, in the 100 meter class land in the ocean, then there would be a kind of tsunami. But calculations, we've never seen this, calculations indicate it's shorter range. It would be like these landslides in the Norwegian fjords. Build up a big wave, do terrible damage locally, but not propagate that wave across the ocean. That's what people think I did. We've never, we have never observed an ocean impact, and so we really don't have any direct empirical data. Okay, so what if, we know, um, so is it possible to buy an extraterrestrial object, such as an asteroid or some of the moon, like a property on the moon, and if so, would you be able to, like, call, well, of course you would. Never mind. Well, you can certainly buy lots of extraterrestrial objects called meteorites. Just go on eBay, and you can get lots of them. As far as an actual asteroid, this is a tricky area. It's an area in space law as to whether a mining company, for instance, can just go to an asteroid and mine it and do things to it, and the lawyers I'm sure we'll decide that after years of debate. I can't answer it. Okay. Yeah, you, you, you stressed asteroids as opposed to comets mm -hmm. or Oort cloud objects or, or other things. Is that just because they're easier to see and find or just the likelihood of their they're being involved in a collision or a near Earth. Well, you, you got me there. I ignore comets because I have no idea how we could deal with them. Their orbits are not stable, they change, they don't come by repeatedly, so you can't find them in advance. The good news, and this is the answer I like to give, is that we know that only about 1% of the impacts on Earth are from comets and 99% on asteroids. So I'm selling you an insurance policy against asteroids. But it actually covers 99% of the risk. And I have no idea how to deal with comets. So given uh, the Shelyabinsk event and that uh, speed and size being a constant, what would the difference in various asteroid meter uh, composition have on the energy that was released? Peter, do you want to answer that about asteroid compositions? Okay. Are you speaking into that or into this? I'm speaking into this. Okay. You can have that. Thanks. And then we, we should just take a couple more and, and I'll go home. It's getting late. So the point of going to Chelyabinsk is to, uh, was to um, understand all the sort of circumstances that led to the shockwave, but fundamentally it's the, it's the energy of it coming in that is being dumped in the atmosphere. So it really uh, what was really important is at what altitude was it dumped. And in the case of Chelyabinsk, we found that this meteorite actually very efficiently fragmented. And so most of the energy was dumped at about 30 kilometers altitude. And because it was so high, uh, the shock wave uh, took a while to come down. We also, from the timing, we, we determined that uh, some of the energy came from pieces that survived, including the one that Dave mentioned that uh, landed in Lake Chabaku. Hope that answers your questions. Andy, I think we should quit here. Thank you, Peter, uh, before I get too hoarse. Well, I just want to say, David, that like after all the talks I've heard you give on this topic, I don't know whether I'm more scared or less scared, but I'm definitely better informed. 
thank you so much for all your work and for your time.